get ready for round two of severe storms and another WRAL weather alert day. I'm tracking the timing and the biggest differences we'll see with this incoming system. Then a 100 year old tree falls on top of a local family's home while they're inside. We had just seen Mike May say that they had had a 69 mile per hour wind at the airport. It was maybe 10 minutes later. How they described the moment it fell and the cleanup happening across our area ahead of the next storm threat. Then only on WRAL, the Carolina Hurricanes president is sharing how his team is moving forward with sports betting at PNC. Right now at 7, people across the area are still cleaning up after severe storms knocked out power and brought down trees, some onto homes. And today, crews surveying the damage out to our west confirmed that a tornado, in fact, did touch down there killing one person. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Dan Haggerty and I'm Ashley Rowe. Now we are already looking toward the next system, bringing another round of threats for damaging wind and tornadoes. Meteorologist Kat Campbell is in the WRL Severe Weather Center. Kat, we're not expecting these storms to be quite as widespread. That is correct. There's some big differences with this upcoming system. However, there is still a significant threat for severe weather. The timing a little bit later. It looks like the severe weather threat would kick off around four o'clock. That could shift by a couple of hours. So stay tuned for an update and we'll have that for you tomorrow. Not as much rain. We're not expecting the flooding threat to repeat. Thank goodness, given all the rain that we've seen from the past few systems and super stells are still possible. So these could be severe storms, but they're not likely to be as widespread. A level three threat for severe weather in the southern part of our viewing area, including Fayetteville and the Sand Hills. A level two threat for severe weather for the remainder of the viewing area, and that includes the triangle. The system that we're watching right now is in the northwestern part of the country. It's going to dive to the south and pick up more moisture in the coming days, and I'll track its arrival hour by hour coming up. Thank you. The worst of the damage from the storms that hit our state was out to the west in Catawba County. You see some of the images here. One person died there this afternoon. Crews confirming it was a tornado that touched down in the area. National Weather Service team surveyed that damage today. They say initial findings indicate an EF1 ripped through a community there. It's 110 mile per hour winds. The path of, of the destruction was 240 yards wide. Two other people were seriously hurt. In the last couple of hours, crews have made major progress with power outages, restoring all but about 4,000 across the state. But some of the damage left behind in some communities is life-changing. WRL's Carly Haynes is live in Garner off of Lakeview Drive. Carly, that's where a woman crawled out of storm debris to survive. <laughs> That's right. Uh, big trees like this fell all over the area. For this one particular homeowner, it's not the first time a tree has fallen, but it was the worst in terms of the damage. Look at this. The tree fell across her yard, through the roof, into her living room, and she was sitting underneath the tree when it fell. She was sitting in her office chair there when the roof crashed over her head. She told us she panicked. She had no idea what to do, but she scrambled and managed to crawl out from that debris through a really small opening. She was taken to the hospital and she did find out that she had a concussion from parts of her roof hitting her head. The owner didn't want to be on camera because obviously it was a very difficult day for her, but we were able to walk inside her home with her today as she looked at the damage in the daylight. I don't know how or why I'm still here, <laughs> but I'm very grateful for it. I'm trying to pull out as much as I can salvage because whether it gets torn down or repaired, everything's gonna have to come out anyway. And she has lived in this home for nearly 25 years. She's hoping to get parts of her home covered before Friday's storm, and she's still waiting for insurance to come out here and take a look. Back to you. It is just incredible. She is alive and okay. Things can be replaced. People cannot, right? And clear reminder of this. Carly Haynes, live in Garner. Thank you. Wow. Uh, lingering outages in Durham. Uh, they were the reason four schools had to cancel classes today. Merrick Moore, Burton, and Bethesda Elementary Schools and the Southern School of Energy and Sustainability all closed because of the outages. Tomorrow is expected to be a normal school day. They're hoping to get the power turned back on to everyone soon. Fallen trees also damaged homes and cars in Durham. In one case, it took out power lines that trapped one man at home for nearly 24 hours. Matthew Daniels says he, the tree fell across Hope Valley Road around 530 yesterday evening. It brought down a tangle of wires 
which completely blocked his driveway. A day later, he's not just frustrated by the mess. He, he says it took hours to get a barricade in place on the road in front of his house, causing a near disaster for a driver who hit the tree. It is very disheartening to hear her um, worry about her personal belongings and having to put them in bags. And so I, I feel that it is it's devastating for any family member to see, especially their parent in these conditions. Crews got the wires and tree in front of the Daniels house clear by about four o'clock this afternoon. You know, such damaging events like this can sometimes, in a, in a weird way, give us a whole lot of gratitude. We saw that in Carly's story. And how about this Wendell couple, thankful that a giant 100-year-old oak tree did not completely flatten their home during yesterday's storm. As we've been seeing, many families across the state are still recovering after that damage from heavy rain and strong winds. As WRL's Grace Holland shows us, residents are now picking up the pieces. Tuesday, just before 7 p.m., Ricky and Jean Carter, along with her brother, were glued to WREL storm coverage. We had just seen Mike May say that they had had a 69 mile per hour wind at the airport. It was maybe 10 minutes later, it just came crashing. That's when her husband looked out the window at their giant oak tree. And I said, man, uh-oh, hey, and it, it looked like it was going down in slow motion. The tree came to rest heavily on the roof. Ricky Carter knew it could have been much worse. I think the house was built pretty, pretty good back in the day because big as that tree is, it would have actually went through the houses that they build nowadays. Majestic oak trees offer thick shade. However, they're also known for their shallow root systems. This morning, the Carters were more concerned about this live power line on the driveway. We're, we're just afraid, you know, it's not safe to walk out here and try and do anything with this live power line. They keep telling me every time somebody's coming out here. A Duke Energy crew did arrive around noon to remove the deadly hazard. <laughs> Tree crews made quick work of the heavy limbs on the roof and turned it all into sawdust. It was a drama-filled day for the Carters, who understood it could have been much worse. We'll get by. It's just, hey, just another part of life. Grace Holland, WRAL News. The house is actually Jean Carter's special childhood home. She and her husband returned to live there just four years ago. You can find our extensive coverage of the storms on WRAL.com. And in anticipation of this next round, make sure you have the WRAL News app. You can take radar with you anywhere. Find it wherever you download your apps. I'm Mark Boyle in the WRL Live Center. New right now at 7 o'clock, Hillsboro police need your help in tracking down this man. Several different photos. Take a good look. He was also driving this red SUV. Here's what we know in those photos again up close on your screen. Police there in Hillsboro responded to the Sheets convenience store off of NC 86 this afternoon for a larceny call. Police confronted this man. He fought back with that officer, went to the SUV, got in it, according to police. Police tried to get him out, and at that moment, according to investigators, the suspect hit the gas and actually dragged the officer before that officer was able to break free. The suspect got away driving that GMC ter Terrain SLE and headed towards Durham. Investigators are out there trying to figure out who this man is. They need your help. Very good photos released here. That officer is at the hospital, expected to survive his injuries, described right now as minor. Back to you. Yeah, he'll be easy to identify with those pictures, Mark. Thank you. So we're learning more about this flight. This is the United Airlines flight that made an emergency landing at RDU today. Sky 5 had that vantage point you just saw a moment ago. Flight 654 left Austin at 7 a.m. It was headed to Dulles International. Flight Aware, we looked at that. It shows the path of that flight it was supposed to take. And, and, and then it's more direct path to Raleigh. The 737 landed safely, as you can see here. A landing so smooth, you wouldn't think anything was wrong, except for the fire trucks that were waiting on the runway. Broadcastify scanner traffic suggests there was problems with the engine. Landing 23 right, the United 654, Boeing 737 with 104 minutes of fuel, 111 souls with engine vibrations. 
None of those 111 on board were injured. This comes just days after the FAA grounded Boeing 737 MAX 9 aircraft with plug doors while it investigates an incident in which part of the wall detached mid-flight. We've reached out to United Airlines to learn more about the incident, but no word on what caused this plane to divert to Raleigh. A new EPA report shows coal ash may be even more dangerous than experts thought. This is raising concerns about dozens of sites across the state. We'll explain coming up. Sports betting in our state is nearly here. We sit down for an exclusive interview with the Hurricanes president about what sports betting will look like at PNC. Plus, NC State is off and running. 1974 was the last time NC State and UNC faced each other when 3-0 or better in ACC play. Tonight, one of them will get their first ACC loss. We take you to PNC Arena Live, coming up. Coal ash is more hazardous than previously thought. That's according to the EPA. Yeah, the, the waste substance is a byproduct of burning coal, and it contains things like mercury, lead, arsenic, and other toxic metals. WRL's climate change reporter Liz McLaughlin explains how health risks are complicating cleanup plants across the state. A recent EPA report shows coal ash could increase a person's cancer risk significantly more than previously thought. That's raising concerns about the dozens of sites across the state where at least 9 million tons of coal ash have been used as structural fill, including an exposed mound off Bowling Creek Greenway in Chapel Hill. Well, this is personal to me. My kids grew up here and they, before we knew about the ash, they were playing in the creek near it. And so I don't want anyone else's kids ever to have to experience that. Adam Searing is the only town council member to vote against plans to build on top of the coal ash that currently sits under the Chapel Hill Police Department. The council currently plans to cap it and build new town offices, stores, and a public green space on top. It's not a hard decision to make. Um, we can keep talking about more studies or negotiating with the state, but these are all, to me, passing the buck. We know what the decision should be. Remove the ash, then build. As more is learned about the growing health risks of coal ash exposure, cleanup concerns mount for at least 70 sites across North Carolina. Liz McLaughlin, WREL News. Now, Duke Energy disagreed with the EPA's report, saying the findings aren't reflective of real-world conditions. The rules that prevent development beyond offices and labs in Research Triangle Park could be changing for the first time in 65 years. Right now, corporate campuses sit back from the road. They're shielded by trees and gates. The covenants that have set the rules for development in RTP have been in place since it was founded in 1959. The foundation that manages RTP is looking to change those covenants to allow companies to build denser development on their land, including mixed-use centers with housing. The foundation says it has the potential to create a place for 100,000 people to live. There's nobody living in RTP right now. So a lot of that growth opportunity can be accommodated here to take the pressure off of communities that are really struggling with displacing long-term residents who just can't afford to live in those communities anymore. A majority of landowners and tenants in RTP would need to approve the new covenants. A vote is expected in July. Then the foundation plans to request Wake and Durham counties rezone the land in RTP. So the push is on to start mobile sports betting in North Carolina by March for March Madness. The Lottery Commission hasn't given an exact start date just yet, but all signs are pointing to that date right before the NCAA tournament. And that is good news for teams like the Carolina Hurricanes, who have been preparing for this day for some while. WRL sports investigative reporter Brian Murphy sat down with the team's president to learn more. Don Waddell worked hard to get sports betting passed in North Carolina, meeting with lawmakers and hosting a summit a year ago to give a final push. This week, the Carolina Hurricanes president spoke exclusively with WRL about the start of sports betting and the franchise's decision to partner with Fanatics Sportsbook. <laughs> His hockey team is climbing the standings once again, but Hurricanes president Don Waddell is not slowing down. Not with PNC arena renovations coming and sports betting about to start in North Carolina. 
Yeah, it's been, uh, like I said, it's been a lot of highs, a lot of lows. It went up and down, and uh, to finally get to this point, I can't wait. The Hurricanes picked Fanatics Sportsbook as their betting partner, an agreement necessary for Fanatics to get a license in the state. The company is relatively new to sports betting, but is a leader in sports merchandise, apparel, and collectibles. Fanatics is also a partner with the NHL team in Columbus, Ohio, and has retail sports books at three major sports venues. You know, some of the companies didn't want to do a retail sports uh, book. Um, you know, they're only interested in the online gambling, and you know, we all know that's where the money is. And but we just felt if we had the opportunity to get a, a retail sports book for our fans that come to the uh, the arena on a regular basis, that was uh, uh, going to be a win-win for them. That temporary sports book could go at Backyard Bistro, the restaurant and bar the Hurricanes recently purchased, or it could be at PNC Arena. It will depend on rules set by the North Carolina Lottery Commission. There are customers who prefer to bet in person just like people prefer to bank in person. And so you want to be able to serve all your customers the best way you can. Canes fans can expect to see plenty of promotion of Fanatics as both sides plan for a long partnership with options in the agreement that could last up to 20 years, Waddell said. Really excited to enter the market. As I said, uh, it's a huge sports state. I think the Hurricanes are on a heater right now. And so it's it's hopefully that keeps going and they're relevant long into the, as, as long into the, the summer. The Hurricanes hope to tap into Fanatic's already extensive database of customers built up from years of selling t-shirts and jerseys. All right, Brian Murphy, thank you. It's going to be interesting to see oh, how yeah. this all takes shape once uh, that rollout ha- happens. Hopefully they, they meet that March deadline. Yeah, exactly. It's just a couple months away. Let's get over to meteorologist Kat Campbell. Kat, it's going to be cold tonight and then tomorrow, probably the best day of the week. Right. It's going to be up in the upper 50s with the sun shining. It's going to be feeling great. So enjoy a nice little bit of calm weather that we have in between our two big weather systems this week. 45 degrees outside right now. You're going to wake up to temperatures near freezing and tomorrow ends up being beautiful with highs in the upper 50s. But by Friday, we have another threat for severe storms headed our way. We'll be back in the 60s. And although I know there are a lot of people who enjoy warm weather, you don't want to see temperatures like this in the winter months, at least in January. Typically, that goes with energized atmospheres, and it's out ahead of these powerful systems. That's the only way we can get into the 60s. Once we get to the weekend, our temperatures cool off into the lower 50s, and it'll be feeling much more like January. Friday system certainly different than yesterday's. Yesterday, we saw rain throughout the day. It was a heavy rain flooding risk. I think we'll wake up to dry weather and sunshine Friday. We really wouldn't see the chance for rain ramping up until after lunchtime, with the best chance of storms coming later into the afternoon and evening hours. And it's these storms, especially around 4, 5, 6 o'clock, that I think would have the best chance of becoming severe. They're more separated from this main line back here, and because of that, these could be supercells, and that's where we could see some isolated tornadoes damaging wind gusts. And then as this line moves through, the primary threat for Friday evening would be damaging straight line winds along the line. But the latest models have it clearing out of here by about 9 o'clock Friday night. We'll leave in that chance through 11 o'clock in case we see it shift by a couple of hours in the timing overnight. Temperature outlook behind this system. We've got much cooler air that will follow a high confidence forecast for below normal temperatures January 16th through the 20th and likely through the end of the month. And you can see signs of that on our seven day forecast. We start out with the 60s on Friday. We're more seasonal as we get into Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And then as we get into next week, high temperatures only in the 40s. Low temperatures dip back into the mid-20s. Ashley and Dan. All right. It is only January. We, we got a big time feel for this matchup tonight. NC State and number seven UNC about to about to hit the uh, court in about 30 minutes. Yeah, both teams three and zero in the ACC for the first time since 1974. WRL's Casey Hansen, Pat Welter are live at a sold out PNC Arena where there is more than just bragging rights on the line, guys. That's right, Ashley. I'll tell you what, pick a number UNC right now is at the top of the list. I mean, they are top 10 in the rankings, Casey. Top 10 in net, top 20 offense and defensive efficiency. They've answered every bell this season, but that makes this a huge opportunity for NC State. 
a massive quad one opportunity for State, who had its chances in the non-conference slate, but lost all three games in either neutral or road contest. But to be in this position means a lot for this program because they didn't have a lot of outside expectations coming to this one, just given how many new pieces were in here. But to be in a spot where they're 3-0, a chance to be 4-0 for the first time since 1974, says a lot about the guys that have been brought into this program. Pat. Yeah, DJ Horn, just one of many transfers that's been excellent for State. A lot of reasons to like them, but if you like UNC, it starts with the experience of guys like R.J. Davis and Armando Baycott. Davis right now leading the ACC in scoring. Baycott averaging 21 points, 15 rebounds in his last four games against State, Casey. Kevin Keats and company know all about Baycott and what it's going to take to stop him. I can tell you it's going to take more than D.J. Burns. You can expect a trio of big guys all over Baycott all night long. Yeah, kind of an old-school matchup, right? Battle of the bigs. I loved what Hubert Davis said about D.J. Burns, NC State's big guy. He's, he just laughed when they talked about how they were going to stop him tonight. I think officiating might be the answer between the two of them. And rest assured, Dan and Ashley, if the State fans don't get the calls they want, they are going to hear it here from the faithful. Oh, man. I, I love how loud it is in there. And, oh, yeah. and the, the game hasn't even started. People are just starting to fill in. Sold out crowd. Pat, Casey, thanks so much. All right, take a look at, at some touching video here as we, uh, we end the show. This is uh, the moment an Arkansas woman was reunited with her lost dog in eastern North Carolina. Disco the dog went missing shortly after Christmas and didn't turn up until a week later, more than a thousand miles away. Oh she was gosh. spotted at a Sara Lee factory in Tarboro by workers who had seen a post on a lost pets forum. Disco's owner is happy to have her home and thanks the Edgecombe County Animal Shelter for helping her find Disco. Can you believe it? I know. So how did Disco make her way to North Carolina? Well, Shepman says she later found out that she was taken home from her taken from her home by someone she knew and driven cross country. Good people out there, though, saw the, the yeah. missing poster, and here we are. Exactly. Thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you back here at 10 o'clock on Fox 50 and 11 on WRAL. Good night. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257.